Greetings and welcome back. We are in Senior English B now, and our work for the hour is to treat the Doris Lessing text, No Witchcraft for Sale, on 1328, 1329, and following of your hymnal. I want to begin by, first of all, pointing out that Doris Lessing is a very accomplished writer. I'm reading with you on the top of 1329. Her family moved to southern Rhodesia, of course, now called Zimbabwe, in 1924. For two decades, British control had been forcing two vastly different cultures to live together. Remember, what do we call this? When a, when a culture comes in and dominates another culture, we call it imperialism. Imperialism, right? Every day, white European values and attitudes met face to face with black African values and attitudes. Traditions and beliefs invariably clashed. However, although each culture exhibited distinctive characteristics, they also shared some fundamental cultural assumptions. In this story, we're going to hear about a choice which must be made and some potential peer pressure involved. That's why this text is often associated with shooting an elephant at 3A. You might jot that one down, shooting an elephant. All right, we are about now to turn to a close reading of this text. Pay close attention to two things. One, the source of the peer pressure. Two, the response to that source. Do you agree or disagree with it? Here we go. No Witchcraft for Sale by Doris Lessing. The Farquhars had been childless for years when little Teddy was born, and they were touched by the pleasure of their servants who brought presents of fowls and eggs and flowers to the homestead when they came to rejoice over the baby, exclaiming with delight over his downy golden head and his blue eyes. They congratulated Mrs. Farquhar as if she had achieved a very great thing, and she felt that she had. Her smile for the lingering, admiring natives was warm and grateful. Later, when Teddy had his first haircut, Gideon the cook, picked up the soft gold tufts from the ground and held them reverently in his hand. Then he smiled at the little boy and said, Little Yellowhead. That became the native name for the child. Gideon and Teddy were great friends from the first. When Gideon had finished his work, he would lift Teddy on his shoulders to the shade of a big tree and play with him there, forming curious little toys from twigs and leaves and grass or shaping animals from wetted soil. When Teddy learned to walk, it was often Gideon who crouched before him, clucking encouragement, finally catching him when he fell, tossing him up in the air till they both became breathless with laughter. Mrs. Farquhar was fond of the old cook because of his love for her child. There was no second baby, and one day Gideon said, Ah, uh, Mrs., Mrs., the Lord above sent this one. Little yellow head is the most good thing we have in our house. Because of that we, Mrs. Farquhar felt a warm impulse toward her cook. And at the end of the month, she raised his wages. He had been with her now for several years. He was one of the few natives who had his wife and children in the compound and never wanted to go home to his crawl, which was some hundreds of miles away. Sometimes a small piccanin who had been born the same time as Teddy could be seen peering from the edge of the bush, staring in awe at the little white boy with his miraculous fair hair and northern blue eyes. The two little children would gaze at each other with a wide, interested gaze. And once Teddy put out his hand curiously to touch the black child's cheeks and hair. Gideon, who was watching, shook his head wonderingly and said, Ah, uh, Mrs.? These are both children, and one will grow up to be a boss, and one will be a servant. And Mrs. Farquhar smiled and said sadly, Yes, Gideon, I was thinking the same. She sighed. It is God's will, said Gideon, who was a mission boy. The Farquhars were very religious people, and this shared feeling about God bound servant and masters even closer together. Teddy was about six years old when he was given a scooter and discovered the intoxications of speed. All day he would fly around the homestead in and out of flower beds, <coughs> scattering squawking chickens and irritated dogs, finishing with a wide dizzying arc into the kitchen door. <coughs> 
There he would cry, Gideon, look at me! And Gideon would laugh and say, very clever, little yellowhead. Gideon's youngest son, who was now a herds boy, came especially up from the compound to see the scooter. He was afraid to come near it, but Teddy showed off in front of him. Pick him in, shouted Teddy, get out of my way! And he raced in circles around the black child until he was frightened and fled back to the bush. Why did you frighten him? asked Gideon, gravely reproachful. Teddy said defiantly, he's only a black boy, and laughed. Then, when Gideon turned away from him without speaking, his face fell. Very soon he slipped into the house and found an orange and brought it to Gideon, saying, this is for you. He could not bring himself to say he was sorry, but he could not bear to lose Gideon's affection either. Gideon took the orange unwillingly and sighed. Soon you'll be going away to school, little yellowhead, he said wonderingly, and then you will be grown up. He shook his head gently and said, and that is how our lives go. He seemed to be putting a distance between himself and Teddy, not because of resentment, but in a way a person accepts something inevitable. The baby had lain in his arms and smiled up into his face. The tiny boy had swung from his shoulders and played with him by the hour. Now Gideon would not let his flesh touch the flesh of the white child. He was kind, but there was a grave formality in his voice that made Teddy pout and sulk away. Also, it made him into a man. With Gideon, he was polite and carried himself formally. And if he came into the kitchen to ask for something, it was in the way a white man uses toward a servant, expecting to be obeyed. But on the day that Teddy came staggering into the kitchen with his fists to his eyes, All right, here we go. In pain, Gideon dropped the pot full of hot soup that he was holding, rushed to the child, and forced aside his fingers. A snake, he exclaimed. Teddy had been on his scooter and had come to a rest with his foot on the side of a big tub of plants. A tree snake hanging by its tail from the roof had spat full into his eyes. Mrs. Farquhar came running when she heard the commotion. He'll go blind, she sobbed, holding Teddy close against her. Gideon, he'll go blind! <coughs> Already the eyes, with perhaps half an hour's sight left in them, were swollen up to the size of fists. Teddy's small white face was distorted by great purple oozing protuberances. Gideon said, wait a minute, Mrs., I'll get some medicine. He ran off into the bush. Mrs. Farquhar lifted the child into the house and bathed his eyes with permanganate. She had scarcely heard Gideon's words, but when she saw that her remedies had no effect at all and remembered how she had seen natives with no sight in their eyes because of the spitting of a snake, she began to look for the return of her cook, remembering what she heard of the efficacy of native herbs. She stood by the window, holding the terrified, sobbing little boy in her arms, and peered helplessly into the bush. It was not more than a few minutes before she saw Gideon come bounding back, and in his hand he held a plant. Do not be afraid, missus, said Gideon. This will cure little Yellowhead's eyes. He stripped the leaves from the plant, leaving a small, white, fleshy root. Without even washing it, he put the root in his mouth, chewed it vigorously, and then held the spittle there while he took the child forcibly from Mrs. Farquhar. He gripped Teddy down between his knees and pressed the balls of his thumbs into the swollen eyes so that the child screamed and Mrs. Farquhar cried out in protest, Gideon! Gideon! But Gideon took no notice. He knelt over the writhing child, pushing back the puffy lids till cheeks of eyeball showed. And then he spat hard, again and again, into first one eye and then the other. He finally lifted Teddy gently into his mother's arms and said, his eyes will get better. But Mrs. Farquhar was weeping with terror, and she could hardly thank him. It was impossible to believe that Teddy could keep his sight. In a couple of hours, the swellings were gone. The eyes were inflamed and tender, but Teddy could see. Mr. and Mrs. Farquhar went to Gideon in the kitchen 
and thanked him over and over again. They felt helpless because of their gratitude. It seemed they could do nothing to express it. They gave Gideon presents for his wife and children and a big increase in wages, but these things could not pay for Teddy's now completely cured eyes. Mrs. Farquhar said, Gideon, God chose you as an instrument for his goodness. And Gideon said, yes, Mrs., God is very good. Now, when such a thing happens on a farm, it cannot be long before everyone hears of it. Mr. and Mrs. Farquhar told their neighbors, and the story was discussed from one end of the district to the other. The bush is full of secrets. No one can live in Africa, or at least on the veld, without learning very soon that there is an ancient wisdom of leaf and soil and season. And two, perhaps most important of all, of the darker tracts of the human mind, which is the black man's heritage. Up and down the district, people were telling anecdotes, reminding each other of things that had happened to them. But I saw it myself, I tell you. It was a puff adder bite. The Kaffir's arm was swollen to the elbow like a great shiny black bladder. He was groggy after half a minute. He was dying. Then suddenly a Kaffir walked out of the bush with his hands full of green stuff. He smeared something on the place, and next day my boy was back at work, and all you could see was two small punctures in the skin. This was the kind of tale they told and, as always, with a certain amount of exasperation, because while all of them knew that in the bush of Africa are waiting valuable drugs locked in bark, in simple-looking leaves, in roots, it was impossible to ever get the truth about them from the natives themselves. The story eventually reached town, and perhaps it was at a sundowner party or some such function that a doctor, who happened to be there, challenged it. Nonsense, he said. These things get exaggerated in the telling. We are always checking up on this kind of story, and we draw a blank every time. Anyway, one morning there arrived a strange car at the homestead, and out stepped one of the workers from the laboratory in town, with cases full of test tubes and chemicals. Mr. and Mrs. Farquhar were flustered, and pleased, and flattered. They asked the scientist to lunch, and they told the story all over again for the hundredth time. Little Teddy was there, too, his blue eyes sparkling with health to prove the truth of it. The scientist explained how humanity might benefit if this new drug could be offered for sale. And the Farquhars were even more pleased. They were kind, simple people who liked to think of something good coming about because of them. But when the scientist began talking of the money that might result, their manner showed discomfort. Their feelings over the miracle that was how they thought of it, were so strong and deep and religious that it was distasteful to them to think of money. The scientist, seeing their faces, went back to his first point, which was the advancement of humanity. He was perhaps a trifle perfunctory. It was not the first time he had come salting the tale of a fabulous bush secret. Eventually, when the meal was over, the Farquhars called Gideon into their living room and explained to him that this boss here was a big doctor from the big city, and he had come all that way to see Gideon. At this, Gideon seemed afraid. He did not understand, and Mrs. Farquhar explained quickly that it was because of the wonderful thing he had done with Teddy's eyes that the big boss had come. Gideon looked from Mrs. Farquhar to Mr. Farquhar, and then at the little boy, who was showing great importance because of the occasion. At last, he said grudgingly, the big boss want to know what medicine I used? He spoke incredulously, as if he could not believe his old friends could so betray him. Mr. Farquhar began explaining how a useful medicine could be made out of the root, and how it could be put on sale, and how thousands of people, black and white, up and down the continent of Africa, could be saved by the medicine when that spitting snake filled their eyes with poison. Gideon listened, his eyes bent on the ground, the skin of his forehead puckering in discomfort. When Mr. Farquhar had finished, he did not reply. The scientist, who all this time had been leaning back in a big chair, sipping his coffee and smiling with skeptical good humor, chipped in. 
and explained all over again in different words about the making of drugs and the progress of science. Also, he offered Gideon a present. There was silence after this further explanation, and then Gideon remarked indifferently that he could not remember the route. His face was sullen and hostile. Even when he looked at the Farquhars, whom he usually treated like old friends, they were beginning to feel annoyed, and this feeling annulled the guilt that had been sprung into life by Gideon's accusing manner. They were beginning to feel that he was unreasonable. But it was at that moment that they all realized he would never give in. The magical drug would remain where it was, unknown and useless except for the tiny scattering of Africans who had the knowledge, natives who might be digging a ditch for the municipality in a ragged shirt and a pair of patched shorts, but who were still born to healing, hereditary healers, being the nephews or sons of the old witch doctors whose ugly masks and bits of bone and all the uncouth properties of magic were the outward signs of real power and wisdom. The Farquhars might tread on that plant 50 times a day as they passed from house to garden, from cow crawl to mealy field, but they would never know it. But they went on persuading and arguing with all the force of their exasperation. And Gideon continued to say that he could not remember, or that there was no such route, or that it was the wrong season of the year, or that it wasn't the root itself, but the spit from his mouth that had cured Teddy's eyes. He said all these things one after another and seemed not to care they were contradictory. He was rude and stubborn. The Farquhars could hardly recognize their gentle, lovable old servant in this ignorant, perversely obstinate African standing there in front of them with lowered eyes, his hands twitching his cook's apron, repeating over and over whichever one of the stupid refusals that first entered his head. And suddenly he appeared to give in. He lifted his head, gave a long, blank, angry look at the circle of whites, who seemed to him like a circle of yelping dogs pressing around him, and said, I will show you the route. They walked single file away from the homestead down a Kaffir path. It was a blazing December afternoon, with a sky full of hot rain clouds. Everything was hot. The sun was like a bronze tray whirling overhead. There was a heat shimmer over the fields. The soil was scorching underfoot. The dusty wind blew gritty and thick and warm in their faces. It was a terrible day, fit only for reclining on a veranda with iced drinks, which is where they would normally have been at that hour. From time to time, remembering that on the day of the snake it had taken ten minutes to find the route, someone asked, is it much further, Gideon? And Gideon would answer over his shoulder with angry politeness. I'm looking for the root, boss. And indeed, he would frequently bend sideways and trail his hand among the grasses with a gesture that was insulting in its perfunctoriness. He walked them through the bush along unknown paths for two hours in that melting, destroying heat so that the sweat trickled coldly down them and their heads ached. They were all quite silent. The Farquhars, because they were angry. The scientist, because he was being proved right again, there was no such plant. His was a tactful silence. At last, six miles from the house, Gideon suddenly decided they had had enough. Or perhaps his anger evaporated at that moment. He picked up, without an attempt at looking anything but casual, a handful of blue flowers from the grass. Flowers that had been growing plentifully all down the paths they had come. He handed them to the scientist without looking at him, and marched off by himself on the way home, leaving them to follow him if they chose. When they got back to the house, the scientist went to the kitchen to thank Gideon. He was being very polite, even though there was an amused look in his eyes. Gideon was not there. Throwing the flowers casually into the back of his car, the eminent visitor departed on his way back to his laboratory. Gideon was back in his kitchen in time to prepare dinner, but he was sulking 
He spoke to Mr. Farquhar like an unwilling servant. It was days before they liked each other again. The Farquhars made inquiries about the route from their laborers. Sometimes they were answered with distrustful stares. Sometimes the natives said, We do not know. We have never heard of the route. One, the cattle boy, who had been with them a long time and had grown to trust them a little, said, Ask your boy in the kitchen. Now there's a doctor for you. He's the son of a famous medicine man who used to be in these parts, and there's nothing he cannot cure. Then he added politely, Of course, he's not as good as the white man's doctor, we know that, but he's good for us. After some time, when the soreness had gone from between the Farquhars and Gideon, they began to joke. What are you going to show us the snake root, Gideon? And he would laugh and shake his head, saying a little uncomfortably, But I did show you, Missus. Have you forgotten? Much later, Teddy, as a schoolboy, would come into the kitchen and say, You old rascal, Gideon. Do you remember that time you tricked us all by making us walk miles all over the veld for nothing? It was so far my father had to carry me. And Gideon would double up with polite laughter. After much laughing, he would suddenly straighten himself up, wipe his old eyes, and look sadly at Teddy, who was grinning mischievously at him across the kitchen. Ah, little yellowhead, how you have grown. Soon you will be grown up with a farm of your own. There's often two readings of this final line. One, excited, like, oh, I can hardly wait for you to grow up and have a farm of your own. There's another reading, though, that suggests that maybe the way to read that final line is not so excitedly or expectantly, but how. How might else this line be interpreted? Yeah, it won't be long before you will have lost that childhood innocence and have become a white man, just like all the other white men, right, who led me through the jungle looking for this information, and there wasn't any way I was going to share that information with them. Let's talk about it real quickly now for your notes. What is the peer pressure that's involved in this story? It's a fascinating story, isn't it? You have a man who has knowledge. He saved a kid's sight through that knowledge. But notice that knowledge is somehow different from Western medicine and Western medicinal approaches. It's herbal-based, right? It's not something constructed by a human being. It's something discovered and used only by humans, and very particular humans, right? Now all of a sudden the title becomes clearly obvious. What's the title of the story again? No Witchcraft for Sale. Ah, which means what? Gideon refused to do what? So how would you qualify the peer pressure? The peer pressure is simply what? Right, white people, the western man, pressuring Gideon, in this case the native, to give up his information. What do they, what do they promise him could come his way? Dude, you can have money and by extension power. Why do you think those kinds of temptations don't carry any weight with him? Why? He's very content with, with where he is and who he is. How does he resolve the issue of peer pressure? Does he give in to the peer pressure? No, he really doesn't. What does he do? He does. He kind of plays a game with them, doesn't he, right? He says, yeah, sure, I'll do this. I'll give it to you. Oh, wait, no, we got to go here. Oh, wait, no, we got to go here. Oh, wait, no, we got to... And finally, after how many miles of walking? Six miles of walking, finally he goes, yeah, this is the one. The scientist, interestingly, does he get it or does he not get it? Do you get a sense of this? Because the scientist figured out this isn't going to happen. Right? In other words, we're lost here. We're not gonna, we're, he's not going to give in. Do you think he did the right thing? Gideon did the right thing? This is a complicated question. Is it possible that Gideon could have helped Western medicine discover an herbal approach that would help save other people's eyesight? Right? 
He could have. Why do you think he doesn't share this information with those white scientists? Talk to me about the issue of trust. Write that one in your notes. How does the issue of trust have something to do with the decision to not share this information? And Gideon lives with white people. And yet, what's the story suggest in the end about trust? Yeah. There's just certain things that he cannot trust them with. Right? What was Gideon's father? He was a doctor, wasn't he? But a doctor of a different kind, huh? Right? A doctor of a, of a different kind. Of course, we can think about similar kinds of stories from history, can't we? Where when cultures meet, they often do not understand each other, huh? Right? There's a certain kind of Western perspective here described as the white man's perspective. And often that perspective goes diametrically opposed to other kinds of non-Western perspectives, right? In this case, who won? In this story, who won? Yeah, that non-Western, that non-white perspective ends up winning, right, in the end. Although, notice the young man, Teddy, he gets his side back. What's the relationship between Teddy and Gideon going forward? Right? Young Teddy grows up, doesn't he? Do you think Teddy will be just like the Western scientists? Or will he be different? Will he have a different perspective and respect for non-white culture? How can you have a sense that he maybe has a different respect than the scientists? At the very end of the story, right, he's kind of bantering with him, but it's like he kind of understands as well, huh? In other words, I kind of get it. I kind of remember, ha, ha, that was kind of funny, huh? The way you led us all around, Dad had to carry me, et cetera, et cetera, right? Well, there you go. Now you're ready to begin the process of maybe giving some consideration to a comparative analysis. Remember, we're